Thank you, Susan. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Um, I know it could be your day off or you're at lunch, but thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Zomatica, for asking me to do this today. As mentioned, I do work here, but it's always fun to do these webinars. So we're going to talk about non-invasive diagnostic and treatment options today. And I've since learned that I create the most boring CE presentation titles on the planet. So I'm going to work on that for my next presentations, um, but we're stuck with it for right now. So as Susan mentioned, my name is Jen Vitucci. I live in the panhandle right now, and it's almost been two years. Time is flying. Um, I was in general practice for 15 years. I am a certified canine rehabilitation therapist through the Canine Rehab Institute, and I've been with Pulse Vet and Medica almost two years. I have a little bit of a hobby farm down here in Florida. So you'll hear a little bit about my husband, a little bit about my pets, but that is my dog, the Bernie's Mountain Dog Vocal, like the skis, V-O-L-K-L. I have a dog, two cats, three goats, six chickens, a pig, a rabbit, a bearded dragon, a cockatoo. I think that's it for the time being. It changes daily, so we might end up with more, maybe snake necks, I don't know. So what are we going to talk about today? We are going to talk about thermal imaging. So that's going to be our non-invasive diagnostic. We're going to start out with that. We're going to talk about what it is, how do we use it, and how can it benefit my patients and my practice. And then we're going to switch over to talking about shockwave. So we're going to talk about how shockwave works, the mechanism of action, the indications that we would use it on, and then also how it can benefit us. So we're going to go over a little bit of research, a little bit of cases, try and make it as exciting as we can for the next hour. And then we'll open it up for questions in the last few minutes. So as mentioned, that is Pickles up top, the sulfur crested cockatoo. That is Vicky Bean, the pig, our Cooney Cooney. And then that's one of our goats, Axwell. So diving right in. As mentioned, I did practice. I had the glory of practicing for a year um, as a GP owner after COVID. So I can't believe we're going to be three years in. But, you know, it changed the way we practice medicine on so many levels. You know, we all went curbside. We had to figure that out. Now some of us are still curbside, but also we have staff shortages, vet shortages, you know, just a whole host of issues in veterinary medicine. And so thermal imaging is a good way to communicate with our clients. So it provides a very objective, beautiful image to share with our clients because we all know we just don't have the same amount of face-to-face -face time with our owners as we used to, regardless of the reasons or all of those reasons put together. So it's fun for me to talk about thermal imaging. I don't work for thermal imaging. I'm not affiliated with any of them, but it's a very, very cool technology that I'm excited to talk about today. So we've always had the problem that our patients are not able to show or tell us what's wrong, right? Very rarely do they come in talking or with their wallets attached to their collars. That would be perfect. But we are always relying on, you know, all of the other tools in our toolbox to figure out what's going on. And then the pandemic, and as I mentioned, all the other challenges has made communication with clients even more difficult, right? We do a lot more drop-offs, a lot more tech appointments, and our time has just become much more valuable. So again, we're just losing that face-to-face -face time with our customers. And I don't think that that's probably ever going to be exactly the same as it was in 2018, 2019, right? Practice has changed pretty permanently, I think, in these ways. And thermal imaging is a good way to provide a solution to those couple problems, right? So it gives us immediate information about our patients that we can't get with other methods. It can help improve our patient outcomes because it gives us an indication of something that maybe needs further examination. We can use it to monitor patient progress. If we're talking about therapeutics or medication or rehab programs, it's an objective way to keep track of all of that. And it also provides a really good way to communicate with our pet owners about why we're recommending maybe x-rays or an ultrasound or why we're recommending laser or shockwave or some other type of therapy because it gives them a really clear picture as opposed to us just describing it verbally with what we're trying to get done. So what is infrared thermal imaging? 
So you guys can read, but it's a measurement, compilation, and analysis of the radiated electromagnetic energy. So it's we're measuring electromagnetic energy coming from the patient in the infrared spectrum. And then we're using software to compile all of that information and generate this really wonderful black or white or color image, depending on how we like to do it. So the equipment's measuring the energy, and then we're using the software to create the image for us to interpret. So we have to touch on physics a couple times today. So we got to go back all the way back, but you don't need to know much. So the electromagnetic spectrum, right? There's just a review of the different wavelengths that are emitted. So the visible eye, we can see 400 nanometers to 700 nanometer wavelengths. That's a very thin sliver that our eyes are able to see and process. So this lovely gray tabby, drinking out of this bowl, this is what it looks like to our naked eye. When we are able to utilize the infrared portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, we increase our ability to see the wavelengths in that spectrum of 700 nanometers to a million nanometers. So a ton more information that we can get once we're able to utilize that infrared portion. So that same cat that gray tabby now looks like this after we're utilizing the software and the information that we have. That's what kitty looks like. And then we can also use it, there's a black and white image, once the cat moves off of the surface, right, we're able to sort of measure that eminent heat that's left. So it just utilizes a much broader spectrum and gives us a bigger picture of what's going on in our patients. But when we talk about that, infrared electromagnetic spectrum that we're measuring, what is that actually correlating to, right? And so it corresponds to basically the surface body temperature and underlying the circulatory patterns within the patient. And the patterns are unique to each patient. So we can't compare, you know, my Bernie's Mountain Dog to your Bernie's Mountain Dog or your Golden Retriever. We have to use the patient as its own control. So this is an example of an image, right? We're top down looking at the dorsal aspect of a dog. And you can see that most of the back is running about the same temperature. And then we have that really concentrated hot spot in the middle. But we're using the rest of the back as the control to let us know that that's what's abnormal. And that's the nice part is we don't need, you know, to compare to anything else. We're just comparing to the patient itself to get our information. So normal, healthy patients are thermally symmetric, right? So if you have normal blood flow, you're going to have a pretty even symmetric surface temperature. Unhealthy patients become thermally asymmetric. So those tissue changes change the blood flow, and then you get different abnormal asymmetric surface temperatures. So similar to that image we saw before, where most of the back was the same color, and then we had that really concentrated spot in the middle, this is another example of a thermal image, right? Top down, we're looking towards the rear of the dog caudal aspect. So the left part's on the top and the right part's on the bottom. And you can see that they're not the same. They're not the same as the rest of the back and then they're not the same as each other. So that would give us an idea of, hey, something might be going on here that we need to investigate further. And these images are showing hyperthermic temperatures. It's also possible to be hypothermic. But once we know, okay, this is correlating to blood flow on the surface, it's not symmetric, we're having these regions of interest, what is that actually telling us, right? What information are we getting from that that's going to lead us further down the diagnostic path? So unexpected warmer areas, right, distinguish physiological change or cooler areas. And a difference of a degree Celsius is significant. So if that's how different the areas are, whether each leg or different areas on the back, that's what's been determined to be significant and mean something for us to investigate and in our patients. So on this dog, right, we're looking at the left lateral surface and then the right lateral surface. And you can see it's circled where we have some differences in temperature. So running a little hotter on that left lateral limb as opposed to on the right side. So again, if there's a difference of a degree Celsius or more, that's significant in terms of blood flow and tissue changes. So if it's hotter, 
right? If we have hyperthermic activity, what does that mean? It means we have an area of increased vascularization. So that could mean inflammation, that could mean an injury to a tendon or ligament, it could mean infection in that area, it could be a cancerous process. So we don't exactly, it doesn't tell us exactly what's going on, it just lets us know that there is something going on that we probably need to look into a little bit further. So, you know, geriatrics or athletic patients, right, are going to have numerous areas probably of hyperthermic activity because they probably have some small injuries, they might have some arthritis or inflammation in that area. So you might have a few different spots that are going to light up. When it gets colder, so if we have an area of hypothermia, then we're going to have a decrease in vascularization. So that could be abnormal nerve function, vasoconstriction, infarctions, scar tissue, muscle atrophy, muscle wasting, any of those things. And you can see up here on this dog, right, it's a little bluer right behind the neck. And so that means we're having a different type of vascular disturbance. We're having decreased blood flow. And again, something significant is probably going on in the patient, at least enough for us to recommend like, hey, we need to do some further testing, more exam, x-rays, ultrasound, whatever sort of our next diagnostic of choices. So hyperthermic, we're thinking increased blood flow and hypothermic, decreased blood flow. It could be for a variety of different reasons. But it's giving us an evaluation in real time, right? So it's actually what's going on in this moment. And it's talking about assessing circulatory system, our nervous system, and our musculoskeletal system. So we're getting that physiologic exam right now with what's happening with the patient, not what happened a week ago or what's going to happen. We actually know what the body is doing in this moment. So once we think about that, uh, everyone's like, well, we can use our palpation skills, right? A lot of us, you know, we can tell when things are warm, we can tell when things are cold. So why wouldn't we just rely on that instead of using something like thermal imaging? And I always laugh when I get to this slide, so thermal imaging equipment, the standard, because this is used in human medicine as well, and veterinary, is to measure less than 0.02 to 0.03 degrees Celsius difference. So that's what's showing up, in, you know, when we look at that image after the software compiles it. Fingertip palpation can detect an increase in temperature of a degree to a degree and a half of Celsius, and a decrease, we're much more sensitive when it comes to cold, of 0.3 to 0.5. And I laugh when I get to the slide because I would love to have been in this temperature sensitivity study. I know people who have amazing palpation skills. I consider my husband to be one of them. My, we call my fingers dead. I would be shocked if I was actually able to determine this level of temperature increase and decrease. I've worked really hard in 15 years. I practice, but I just don't have great sensory input from my fingers. So I would be, it would be comical to me to see if I could actually do it. But even if we could do it, it's, we can't show that to the owner, right? And even if, and we try and make the owner feel it, they might not necessarily be able to feel it. So it's still something that we have to communicate verbally as opposed to this beautiful thermal image that we can show them like, hey, this is a hot spot, this is a cold spot. So it's gonna be 50 to 70 times, 75 times more sensitive than our fingers for detection of heat and 15 to 25 times more sensitive to cold. So again, it's gonna be more sensitive than we're able to palpate and also really easy to show the owners what's happening. And there's a lot, a lot of research actually on thermal imaging in humans and veterinarians. So I just wanna to touch on just a couple of the studies that I thought were really interesting. So one of them, this was published in 2018, and it was using thermal imaging to rapidly and accurately detect feline aortic thromboembolism, right? So when you have that down cat, we always want to know, is it an ischemic or non-ischemic condition in pelvic paralysis? And they found that thermal imaging had excellent specificity and sensitivity to find that aortic thromboembolism, which makes sense, right? If we're detecting blood flow, it should be amazing at determining the blood flow in the limbs and where maybe that thromboembolism is. 
And this was published in 2019 on appendicular bone tumors. So it's not a sole diagnostic criteria for bone cancer, but it serves as a good screening tool for early detection, right? So you can see that image in the bottom from the study where they're starting to already notice some increased blood flow, which is hopefully going to trigger us to do some additional diagnostics. Um, I know they've use this and have studies on using it in humans for like breast cancer and other types of cancers. If we can notice that it's hot and increased blood flow, then we can, you know, use it as early screening and encourage that additional diagnostic testing. And this was published pretty recently, I think a year or two ago, and it was using thermal imaging to monitor laser therapy. So it wasn't assessing whether the laser therapy was working or not. It just wanted to compare what the clinician and the owner was seeing with the thermal images and if it made sense clinically, right? So we were able to sort of objectively say, hey, the patient's doing better or worse. Is that what it looks like on thermal image? And that's what they found in the study. So they were having pain score um, changes and again, an observed and measured clinical response. So these are some images from that study. So patient one on the top, patient two in the middle, and patient three at the bottom. And it's day zero and day seven. And in the top two, you can see that we have a decreased hyperthermia, right? The areas look cooler, they look less red. And that correlated to how the clinician and the owner felt the patient was doing in life, right? They had improved clinic clinically and improved pain scores. So it was an objective way to say this is what we're seeing and it's also what we're measuring with our thermal image. But in the third patient, right, it's increased hyperthermia. It's not doing better according to the thermal images. It looks like it's doing worse. And that was actually what they found in the patient too. So it was the pain scores were worse and there was no clinical improvement. So just a really interesting way to add in to objectively measuring what we're recommending, right? It's gonna help us recommend diagnostics and then it can help us sort of keep track. Hey, we think you should do laser. We think you should do this. You know, is it really working? And then we can sort of show the owner this image, like, hey, it is doing something, which is always gonna improve patient outcomes because we're gonna improve client compliance. So there's all different ways to use this in practice. I hear all different ways, you know, some, Clinics just use it as a standard screening tool, or you can use it for leanness or whatever makes sense. But if you were doing just a screening where the technicians can do it before the dog even comes in the room, you know, there's a few standard views that can give you a lot of information. So top, bottom, left, right, front, back, and then always the orthostatic exam, which I think is really interesting. After they're done weight bearing, right? We can see if they're offloading any legs or if anything looks fishy on from a leanness point of view. So here's a little blow up of that. This is a cute little dog. And obviously they bear more weight in the front than the back. So that makes sense, but pretty even between paws. So just an interesting way to try and work it in to practice and all different ways to try and use it. So what, again, just to kind of sum everything up, right? We're using that tool to measure the radiated energy, which is corresponding to our surface temperature and our blood flow. And it's gonna identify areas that need further evaluation and may benefit from further diagnostics. So it's a screening tool, right? It's not a sole diagnostic, but it gives us objective information when we make our recommendations and is a really nice thing to share with our owners. And as we talked about, it can objectively monitor any of our treatment plans, right? Whether we're using a modality or rehab or meds, whatever that involved, you know, we can monitor it and track it and feel good about what we're doing. And then it's a really great client education tool by providing that visual evidence. Again, you know, instead of saying, we're seeing that it's sore in the shoulder, we're seeing that it's sore in the elbow, we can actually show them what that looks like and why we think that way, even more than our exam is going to show us. And that's always going to improve client compliance, which is always going to help with our patient outcomes. So it's just an interesting tool that can allow us to take better care of our patients, right? It gives us that knowledge of what's happening right now and can kind of help show the owners why we want to do what we want to do and help us keep track of how they're responding to our therapies.
Okay, so that was our diagnostic screening tool. So now we gotta flip our brain over um, and we're gonna talk about therapy, right? So we are gonna talk about shockwave. So what is a shockwave, right? It's nothing to do with electric shock. It is a term left over from human medicine when it was designed, but it's simply a term for a high energy sound wave. And it's made naturally all the time. I live by the Air Force Base, so they drop bombs, aircraft go by me, all sorts of things, explosions. But one of the easiest ways to think about it is lightning and thunder. So lightning is an electrical impulse that actually changes the pressure of the air around it, which creates the sound of thunder. And when you hear that big boom of thunder, you'll often feel your walls or your windows shake. And that's literally sound energy being deposited into your house. So that's what it is. We're causing this sudden pressure change, lots of noise, and then it gets absorbed into our home. So what isn't a shockwave, right? Just for comparison, you'll often hear about radial devices more in human, a little bit in veterinary medicine, but it's more of a, it does make noise, but it's a mechanical energy. It doesn't actually use the sound energy to initiate the healing. Um, it uses that mechanical energy, the way it's kind of pushing on you. And then compared to laser, laser uses light energy. So it's gonna have a little bit lower penetration depth, a little less energy, because when light hits tissue, it does different things, right? It can heat up, it can refract, all those things happen as compared to sound when it enters, especially a really watery, you know, body, like our bodies or our patients' bodies, it travels really, really well in sound. So it's able to stay intact and deliver a pretty large amount of energy to the desired area. So again, my last physics slide, but we do have to talk just a little bit about some of the things that define a shockwave. So it has to have this very rapid rise time. So that pressure front happens really quickly. It has this slight cavitation dip at the end, and then it has to have a clearly defined focal area. So when we talk about different shockwave generators in the next slide, I just want you to think about this blue oval in the lower graph. And that's where we're talking about the focal area. So it's really important to just kind of remember that in your mind. And however you generate a shockwave, it matters the reflector shape and the shape of your handpiece. And that's how that focal zone is determined, how big it is, how deep it is. All of that kind of depends on the reflector shape and the standoff, all of that. But that's really when we talk about focal zones, we're talking about that blue area. And it has to be easily measured. And that's how we define the energy going to the area. So there's all different ways to make one. Electrohydraulic is that lightning and focus thunder. So it's going to be that spark plug in water. It's going to create that sudden pressure change. It has the largest focal area and the highest peak pressure and the fastest rise time. So it's really a true shockwave at all of the settings. Electromagnetic is like loudspeaker. So right when you see like a loudspeaker, the front sort of booming and vibrating, there's the coils in there that they put electricity across again. And then it, you know, creates the pressure, moves it around, creates the sound. It's going to have a little smaller focal area, a little lower peak pressure, and is a little slower rise time and is a true shockwave at the higher energy settings. Piezoelectric is these focused vibrating crystals. So again, we have crystals inside our handpiece. We put electricity across them inside some sort of fluid. So it creates the sound, creates the pressure change, and then directs it out into our tissue. And we determine that focal area. Little bit smaller focal area, again, little bit lower peak pressure, and was originally designed to break up kidney stones in humans. So it's kind of had this small, intense focal area so it can break up a kidney stone, but not damage the surrounding tissue. And then as we mentioned, that radial pressure wave is really more a mechanical energy, but they call it a shock wave. So it can be a little bit confusing, but it's a very unfocused sound energy. It's really just the mechanical energy that's stimulating the healing. So as I said, this is an example of an electrohydraulic shockwave generator. So you can see the spark plug inside there and you can see the shape of the reflector and the shape of the handpiece, right, is gonna determine our focal area. So we light off 
that electrical impulse, we change the pressure, create the sound, and it goes into our tissues, right? With this very, very large focal area. And that's how all of them work. The shape of the reflector and the handpiece determines where our focal area is and how deep it is. This is not to scale, so don't judge me, but the goal was just kind of to show a ratio of the different focal zones and the volume of tissue that's affected depending on which device you're using. So why are we sort of beating this focal zone and energy to death, right? Why do we talk about it so much? And it's because you have different treatment protocols, right? If you are using a smaller focal area, it's going to take more pulses and more treatments to deliver the same amount of energy than it would if you're treating a larger area at one time. So piezoelectric is going to be 750 to 3,000 pulses per treatment. Electrohydraulic is going to be 500 to 1,000. The total number of treatments, minimum six to eight versus one to three, and the frequency, um, one to two times per week versus every two weeks. Again, it's because of that focal zone and how much energy. So it's just important to understand which device you're using and how your shockwave is being generated to make sure that your treatment protocols are going to be appropriate for what you want them to be. So now that we know what a shockwave is, right, it's this high energy sound, there's all different ways to make it. So what happens once it goes inside our tissue? So it's transmitted superficially with ultrasound gel. It goes into the tissue and it gets deposited along the way at areas of density change or acoustic impedance. And microscopically, it gets absorbed at the cellular level. So compressive and tensile forces are actually applied to the cells. It's a physical force. They squish a little bit. And in response to that squish, they release a bunch of cytokines and growth factors for healing. It does kind of a host of things, but some of the biggest ones, right, are we're increasing blood flow, um, we're controlling pain and inflammation. We're releasing BMP for bone regeneration and healing. We're bringing in new blood vessels, vasodilating, releasing endogenous nitric oxide. So all of these cytokines and growth factors get released, which is what stimulates the healing process. So it's actually that physical force that causes this biological response within the body. And if you don't like words, here's just kind of a picture saying the same thing, the different cytokines and growth factors and what happens inside the body and how we talk about initiating this healing pro process with shockwave. It's been shown to do a few other things like disrupt biofilm. So biofilm is that sort of, I call it invisible, but it's not invisible. That's sort of force field that the bacteria secrete that protects them from antibiotics. So it's been shown to disrupt that and allow our antibiotics to work better. We're going to talk about this a little bit when we talk about indications, but it's been shown to decrease cartilage degradation and inhibit the increase of those inflammatory enzymes in arthritis and remodel that subchondral bone. And it's also able to induce a temporary analgesic effect, which can be important in all of our patients, depending on if we're um, talking about performance or post-op, able to really create that numbing effect. So thinking about all those things that it does, where do we want to think about using it? Okay, so shockwave, higher energy sound, initiating the body's own healing process. So first one, tendon, ligament, and muscle healing. So this is really shockwave on the equine started because they were getting these suspensory ligament injuries that they were letting rest and they heal, as you know, in sort of a scarred up mess. They do heal, but not in that perfect linear fiber pattern. And they found that using shockwave sort of returned it to that linear fiber pattern. And so, you know, started with suspensory ligaments, but moving out into shoulder injuries, Achilles tendon injuries, partial cruciate tears, iliopsoas strains, um, any of those things, it can be effective at helping to bring in that healing. This was one of the first studies they did in small animals when we were talking about tendon and ligaments. So Dr. Alan Cross at Georgia Vet Specialist, which is now Blue Pearl, it um, published a study on patellar ligament desmitis post-TPLO. So it's kind of a common sequela, right? We sort of expect 
that there might be some patellar ligament thickening. So the patients were treated at four and six weeks post-op, and then they measured the patellar ligament thickness at six and eight weeks. And they found that it was significantly decreased in thickness. So it was having an effect on decreasing that swelling and healing up that tendon and ligament. So bone healing. We talked about releasing BMP and stimulating that cellular bone production. So post fractures, post osteotomies, delayed unions, non-unions, all good places to stimulate that bone healing and speed up. Or if we're worried, sometimes we have a comorbidity, right? Like a cushionoid or a diabetic patient that we're a little bit worried about healing anyway, this can help. Just a little touch on the research. So this was done at Colorado State and um, published in 2015. And so it was a two-part study. This is from phase one, and they wanted to just see if they shockwave post-TPLO at zero in two weeks, are we having accelerated bone healing? So the first group, they did a whole bunch of x-rays at four, six, eight, and 10 weeks. And they found that the healing was statistically significant at week four and improved at six and eight. But interestingly, at eight weeks, all the shockwave treated dogs had healed osteotomies compared to half of the sham group were considered healed. They weren't at that nine or 10 range quite yet at eight weeks, but with the shockwave, they were. So then they went on to do a bigger study after that, but this is just some x-rays from that initial study. And you can see six weeks post-op, we got the sham group here on the left and the shockwave treated group on the right. So you can see at six weeks, you know, that osteotomy line is starting to disappear, showing a pretty decent amount of healing at six weeks. So they went on to do a much bigger study with a whole bunch of patients enrolled, and they just took x-rays at eight weeks and had them scored by the radiologist, and they no major complications, all the osteotomies healed, but the median healing scores at eight weeks were significantly higher in the shockwave-treated group than they were using both the scoring systems than in the non-shockwave treated group. So tendons, ligaments, bone healing, and now osteoarthritis, right? So we call it, you know, it can be part of this multimodal approach to OA pain management because it's gonna have some symptom management and a little bit of disease management, which we'll talk about in just a minute. So anywhere that you can get arthritis, right? Shoulders, elbows, hips, intervertebral joints, um, shockwave can be indicated for. So just a little review of the osteoarthritis cycle. So, right, it starts with some sort of instability, whether that be muscle weakness or injury, old age, we get a synovitis, we get this overproduction of macrophages and synoviocytes, the macrophages overproduce those pro-inflammatory cytokines. Then we have inflammatory mediators. We start driving cartilage destruction, and then we get chronic pain, inflammation, and disability. And, and we're on a cycle, right? Because we haven't, once we start, right, and we have this irritated joint, we know that it's going to keep going around. So if you see a patient today with arthritis, we assume it's going to have some level of progression if we checked it again in a year. So where shockwave's been shown to interfere is right here, where they overproduce those pro-inflammatory cytokines. So it's able to decrease that overproduction and then increase the production of good things like VEGF and BMP and decrease osteocalcin and COMP and tissue necrosis factor. So that's when we talk about where shockwave helps to slow down cartilage degradation and remodel that bone, we're talking about that part of the cycle right there. And so it's going to help to slow the overall progression as well as control the pain and inflammation in the moment. So Dr. Millis and Dr. Drum at the University of Tennessee did a shockwave study on naturally occurring end-stage elbow OA. Um, it was a small study, small group. They got shockwave at day zero and 14 and were measured at zero, 14, and 28 days. Um, but they found that the magnitude of improvement in ground reaction forces and leanness were similar to what we would expect the first time they would go on an NSAID. Um, and they had increases in their peak vertical force and weight bearing. 
So it did make a nice improvement in the sort of end stage patients that we know we kind of do everything we can do and we don't have a lot of other options. So besides tendon ligaments, bone healing, and then osteoarthritis and chronic pain are kind of together, right? This is obviously um, osteoarthritis of the back, but any sort of that back pain, myofascial pain. And it says non-neurologic because it hasn't, no shockwave has been shown at this point to regenerate any nerves, right? Um, DM is always the one that we want it to work for. And hopefully we'll, you know, do some more research on that. But any sort of painful myofascial chronic pain in the back. And then last but not least for shockwave is superficial wounds, including lip granulomas. So this was just a case study of a year long duration of lip granulomas um, that was able to be, that's after one treatment in the middle and then after the second treatment. And it had not recurred a year later, but spider bites, um, degloving injuries, something that's healing by second intention. All of those are good indications for shockwave, right? Because we're going to be able to increase that blood flow, bring in all the good stuff, take out the bad stuff. Just a couple other little studies to go through, and then we'll talk about how we use it in our patient. But this was published in 2019 from LSU, and it was on short-term limb use after a TPLO. So they were measuring if they were weight-bearing better, if they shockwaved at zero in two weeks, what then if they didn't. So there were 16 dogs in the study, two groups, right? One group got nothing and one group got two shockwaves. And they found that peak vertical force and vertical impulse were higher at two and eight weeks after surgery in the shockwave-treated dogs compared to the non-shockwave-treated dogs. And, you know, this is fun to talk about bone healing post-TPLO and weight bearing, but also we know it's clinically important, right, how our patients are going to recover from surgery. And then we're also, of course, always worried about that other leg during this recovery period when they're weight bearing so much. So the sooner that we can have our bones healed and we're using that leg, the better off the patient is going to be long term. So this is a graph from that study. So the blue is the shock we've treated and the red is the control group. So you can see pre and two and eight weeks that they are weight bearing significantly better at two and eight weeks and the shockwave treated group than the control group. Little um, pilot study out in California on chronic back pain. So there were 40 patients overall, 38 dogs and two cats. And 34 of them got one treatment and six of them got two treatments. Um, but they found that they had an 87% positive response rate, both from the clinician and, you know, the owner satisfaction that the patients were doing much better. And the median duration of improvement was 13 months. So a pretty long amount of time that they felt like these dogs and couple cats had benefited from shockwave treatment. So shockwave is utilized on the human side as well, but always doing more research um, in our small animal patients and our equine. So a couple studies going on now, one at Ohio State is finishing up and I think about to be presented for publication on lower back pain. There's one going on at Colorado State, a couple blue pearls are doing an infected TPLO study. And then on the equine side, talking about treating bleeders and sarcoids. And then on the human side, electrohydraulic shockwave is approved for plantar fasciitis, tennis elbow, and diabetic ulcers. It's also used for intravascular lithotripsy. So they'll snake it up the artery and sort of break apart those plaques so they can place stents. And then studying post-cardiac infarction. So this is an experimental model of a rat that ABC where they ligated their myocardial arteries and then either shockwave them or didn't. So A is a completely normal um, heart, C had their artery ligated and no treatment, and then B had artery ligated and some shockwave treatments. And so they're just finding that it's instead of replacing it all with scar tissue, it's returning to some normal heart tissue, which is really, really just interesting. 
where all the different studies of shockwave that are going on. So we'll see what happens in the future. So how do we use shockwave in practice, right? So if it's necessary to make good contact, we need to shave the area, wipe it with alcohol. We need to use ultrasound gel. For all of them, we need to make sure that sound is being transmitted. Depending on the device that you're using, um, it used to require sedation. There's now a new handpiece electrohydraulic that expanded the focal volume and allows for sedation-free treatment for most pets. Um, easy peasy. Here's a living its best life. So you want to move the trot around. You're trying to air, you know, you're angling as necessary. You're trying to treat 360 degrees. We're trying to recruit all the cells underneath the handpiece to release those cytokines and growth factors for healing. As we said, the treatment protocols vary according to device. So it depends on how much you need to do, how long it's going to take, but it can take anywhere between three and 10 minutes. Um, there's no risk of burning. There's no risk of damage. You don't need any PPE. There's really not much harm that you can do, unlike some of the lasers that, that heat up. So that's really nice. After treatment, I would say one of three things happens, right? They either feel exactly the same way they did this morning. They can get that analgesic effect for the first couple of days, or sometimes they're a little more uncomfortable for the first couple of days. You know, if we're taking a, you know, chronic area and returning it to more of an acute situation. Sometimes they'll be sore for a little bit. I've sort of likened it to a deep tissue massage. Um, sometimes you feel a little bit more sore before you feel better. And again, depending on the protocol and the device that you're using, you're going to evaluate every one to two weeks and retreat as necessary. Um, electrohydraulic devices, it's going to be one to three treatments total in our small animal patients that we're going to use. So when do we not want to use it, right? There is no age minimum or maximum. So, you know, we're always cautious around the growth plates, but I've seen it used in a lot of long bone fractures or delayed or non-unions. Um, acutely, we're always cautious on acute soft tissue injuries or wounds. Um, you know, the body's kind of already at max healing at that point. So sometimes we wait five to seven days to give it a chance, and then we sort of want to bring in and reinitiate that healing process. The exception I always joke is if we cause the trauma. So if it's an osteotomy like a TPLO or a fracture repair, we can treat immediate post-op. You don't treat directly over an unstable disc or previous spinal surgical site. So if there's a hemilaminectomy or some sort of bone removed, we would not want to treat immediately over that area. And we avoid going over malignant tumors. Again, in the treatment area, which makes sense, right? And we don't want to um, think about increasing blood flow to an area that we're already a little bit worried about. So mast cell tumors, osteosarcomas, things within the treatment zone we'd want to be cautious about. So just a couple fun cases to talk about, give you guys something kind of fun to end with, and then we're gonna kind of bring shockwave and thermal imaging together. So this is JJ, a 15 year old female spade, and it says Australian Shepherd on the uh, paperwork, but you'll see a video in a minute. It's a uh, interesting use of an Australian Shepherd. But so diagnosed with a CCL tear to the left rear leg in October of 21. I keep wanting to say last year, but now it's 2023. Um, came in grade three out of five lame. It had already had a previous TPLO on the right leg and mom was just not in for it this time. So decided to do shockwave. It was already on medicine. It was already part of a rehab program, right? So the only additional treatment was adding in shockwave. So after one treatment, it was two out of five lame. After two treatments, it was barely limping anymore. And then after the third treatment, it had no lameness noted. So that treatment ended in January or February, and this is JJ um, last summer, doing wonderful. The Australian Shepherd. <laughs> and you'll also see that all of my patients are 15. 
Um, and I also have to pick on my husband, right? So this is my husband's case. This is Butters, the 15 year old Chihuahua. Um, I asked him to send me x-rays of which he sent me just a picture of himself taking a picture of the screen. So now I can't change it, but you'll see these left metatarsal fractures. These were about seven to eight weeks old when Butters came in. So put a splint on it and did the first shockwave treatment. So here's Butters living the best 15 year old Chihuahua life. And then here's recheck rads at one month. So did another shockwave and then just did a soft bandage, took the splint off. So you can see starting to generate some healing, looking better. And then here's our recheck rads at two months. So almost completely healed. I apologize that I don't have one more set of x-rays to show you, but went on to completely heal. So easy peasy. And then this was just sort of an interesting one from Dr. Pam Nichols on, it's an 18 month old German Shepherd, right? Came in with progressive multi-limb lameness. So took some radiographs, sent it home on pain meds, came back as pan osteitis. And the owner went home and a few days after treatment just said, he's still so painful, what else can we do? Um, so Dr. Nichols said, well, let's shockwave. So you can see him again, he's already on pain meds at this point. This is a few days into treatment. So shockwave it. And then this is 48 hours after that shockwave treatment. Did that kind of right front elbow, shoulder area. Okay, so as I said, shockwave and review, right? Nothing to do with electric shock. It's just a high energy sound wave. It stimulates the own, the body's own healing process by releasing those cytokines and growth factors. So increasing blood flow, controlling pain and inflammation, stimulating cellular bone production. There's different shockwave generators and they all have different focal areas and require different treatment protocols. So it's just important to know, you know, what modality you have in your hands and how best to use it. And it's been proven safe and effective for many indications, especially on the electrohydraulic shockwave side. There's quite a bit of published and peer reviewed research on using it in these indications in large and small animals. And as I said, it's been used a lot on the human side for many of these things. So good, you know, it's safe and effective and not something new and sort of interesting that we're bringing to our pets, right? So the owners don't need to be scared. So all together, and then I'm going to do one last case study, right? So that thermal imaging gives us that real-time information about our patient's physiologic status, right? So we're getting that surface temperature. It's letting us know if there's areas of increased circulation or decreased circulation letting us know about our circulatory, nervous, and musculoskeletal system. We can use those images to communicate clearly needs for additional diagnostics or to monitor our treatment plans. It gives us a very objective way to communicate with the owners um, to improve client compliance and patient outcome. And as we said, shockwave is that high energy sound wave that we can use in tendon ligaments, fractures, osteoarthritis, pain, wounds. So I was able to use these two together. This is not a, um, you know, to be published. It was just some really interesting information for myself about how we could, you know, we saw the one with the laser. So to pair it up with the shockwave. So this is Brutus, again, 15 years old, um, the male neutered Persian. And he had this progressive left hind limb weakness where he was sort of listing to one side. He was having a hard time getting in and out of the litter box. He wasn't able to jump up anymore. So on radiographs, he had this really arthritic left hip, um, even worried that it had some sort of clot at some point, but, you know, had feeling and everything else. So decided to do shockwave treatments and use the thermal image um, when we started this. So here is Brutus getting his shockwave treatment. And so using um, the thermal imaging, right? So you can see pre, immediate, post, four hour, eight hour. And again, this isn't super scientific. I'm not measuring it, I'm not publishing anything, but I just thought it was really interesting to see um, 
pre and post, you can see that he's a little bit hotter on that left hip and even down into his left stifle. And then immediately after treatment, it gets very, very chilly. And I thought that was a factor of the gel, um, but I actually tested on some other subjects with and without gel. And it's not from the gel. Um, if you do it without the gel and even warm it up, try and rub it out, um, it doesn't change that it gets a little bit cold right away, which makes sense for that sort of immediate analgesic effect, right? And then over time, which is what we would expect, it gets a little bit warmer because we're increasing blood flow to that area. So you can kind of see that left hip starting to get a little bit. And then we have 24 hours, 48 hours, and seven days post-op. And I apologize. This is my, I only have myself to help me with this cat. So it's not the most beautiful images, but just a really interesting way, I think, to put the two together. And then thinking about managing, you know, more and more cases, utilizing the thermal imaging and any sort of therapeutic. Um, but that's what I had at my disposal and, you know, sort of followed an expected pattern, right? And Brutus went on to do great. He got another treatment and had a lot of improvement and was able to get in and out of the litter box and actually was able to jump back up on chairs after that. So, so thank you guys for your attention. That was a little bit of a whirlwind. So I appreciate everyone listening and hopefully learned something.